Hello and welcome to The Travel Show with me, Adia Depitan. This week, I'm in Morocco. Coming up, I'm taking in some modern art in Marrakesh. It's a city with a character, with personality. And when you come here, we'll bring out your character. <laughs> Lucy's got some light years ahead travel gadgets. If you're jet lagged in a foreign country or you're simply struggling to sleep, it could help you feel a lot more revitalised. We head to Lyon to explore the secret alleyways used by the French resistance in World War II. And Carmen takes on another <laughs> Rugby World Cup challenge in Japan. Oh my gosh, Windy Taxi! This is great! We're starting off this week in Marrakesh, where this month international galleries, emerging artists, photographers and collectors from around the world are gathering for 154, an event dedicated to contemporary African art. It's also the first birthday of a groundbreaking museum that's helping the city in its aim to become the continent's first main hub for African modern art. But why here? I went to find out. Marrakesh is one of Morocco's most popular destinations. From its vibrant streets and souks to its rich cultural history. And people from all over flock here to enjoy the vibe. And this place has started to establish itself as an international arts hub, drawing in people who are interested in modern African art. First up, I'm heading to the Montreso Art Foundation. It's one of several places that's encouraging the growth of vibrant artistic communities in Marrakesh. They run a residency program called Jardin Rouge, where artists from all over the world can apply to have their projects funded and developed by the foundation. I've never seen art like this before. Uh, I, I don't even know how to translate it or comprehend it. It's, um, it's mad. I, I feel like I want to touch it, but, you know, I can't. It's his work. I just want to reach out and grab it and see what it's all like, because it looks so tactile. Most of the artists come from across Africa and can stay in residence for up to three months. And with six studios on site, the foundation can support up to eight artists at any one time. Mohamed Syed Shah extracts superheroes from their comic book universe and injects a bit of real life into them. How did you find out about this place? Um, there's a lot of talk about this place in Morocco, you know. Uh, from the day one, I mean, from I started my, my arms career, as it must be, because I, I used to be a banker. You used to be a banker? Yeah. So you've gone from a banker I, I to, a, to an artist? To an artist, yeah. I mean, that's extreme. So would you say Morocco is now becoming the hub or the central place if you're an artist? I don't know, man. I mean, there's kind of energy that brings people all in Morocco. Maybe it's geographical position between Spain and Africa. It's a collision of cultures, isn't it? So when it, the collision of culture, it becomes kind of very interesting. Over the past few years, Marrakesh has seen a considerable amount of public and private investment into the arts. What is that? And several outreach programs designed to engage both the international and local community. And the newest addition to that program is where I'm off to next. This art museum was opened by the wealthy Lazarac family and more than half of his exhibits come from their own private collection. Wow. This is just, it's bonkers. This says to me that absolutely anything can be art. Anything, because this is everything. Macau opened up last year and twice a month, 
they invite different community groups here to, to check out the museum and um, they have this day which is a combination of art and food, couscous and art. I'm going to join in. Whilst the tour is underway, I managed to peel away Miriam, who is the curator here. We want the, the museum to have this, uh, to seem open. And that's our main mission at the Fondation Alliance and the MACAL, is to democratize access to art and to make it really reachable to all audiences. Well, if you're adding couscous to art, that <laughs> makes it reachable to many, many audiences. Couscous is traditionally served as a family dish here every Friday. And it's the same at the museum, to encourage locals to visit and check out what's on offer in a country that traditionally views galleries as something only for the privileged. And it's all kinds of visual arts that are getting a boost here, including photography. One man whose work has been getting a lot of attention here recently is Hassan Hajaj, Made famous by striking and colourful images, he's become one of the country's most respected creatives. And even Madonna is a fan. And now, he's offered to take a photograph of me. So this is where it's all happening, the photo shoot. It's Hassan's home and his studios. I better go in, don't want to be late. A lot of his shoots take place at Riyadh Yima, which is open to anyone who's interested in his works. I'm next. Oh, it's so uh, good to meet you. Good uh, to meet you. Uh, well, welcome to America. Uh, See, I'm going to get accustomed to this, and this is how you're going to have to treat me all the time at the travel show. Hello, Eddie. Hello, Eddie. This is Blue Steel. Like many artists, particularly the up and coming, Hassan's images end up on social media, and that's helping to popularise modern African art. What yeah. keeps drawing you back to Morocco and Marrakesh? In uh, well, if you're an art lover or a writer or a musician, I mean, it's a great place. Uh, it has an energy, you know, like some cities around the globe have energy. It's a city with a character, with personality, and when you come here, it will bring out your character. <laughs> I feel like, a, feel like a, a star now. So if you're thinking of coming to Marrakesh, don't just check out the souks and medinas. Why not look for some art too? It could expand your creative horizons and maybe your wardrobe. Now later this year, we'll be marking the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the Allied landings on the beaches of Normandy, which eventually led to France being liberated from German occupation. Before D-Day, the French resistance had been carrying out clandestine operations against the Germans for almost four years. The city of Lyon was home to many resistance fighters, and if you head there, you can still see some of the alleyways and passages where they hid. Le mot de Treboul, ça vient de latin, du train symbolaire qui se traduit correctement comme l'action de traverser. C'est un allée qui relie deux rues parallèles. C'était des îles extrêmement étroites, euh, plutôt profondes, et là c'est un corps typique des maisons marchandes. aussi dans la cour de la Tour Rose. Une fois, c'était la maison de Crible, celui qui s'occupait des dettes des gens. Nous avons ici cette belle tour qui s'élevait au-dessus de la maison des marchands. Ce n'était pas un tour qui voulait démontrer son pouvoir ni son statut parce qu'on ne l'aperçoit pas depuis la rue. C'était simplement un tour de plaisir, un tour de belvédère. Les traboules, c'est un dispositif de, de passage entre les pâtés de maison qui permet euh, à beaucoup de résistants de s'échapper quand ils sont poursuivis par la police française ou pire par la, la police allemande. Les résistants ont accès directement aux boîtes aux lettres 
Et il faut imaginer que pour organiser des réunions ou pour se transmettre des messages, c'est très compliqué. On n'a évidemment pas de téléphone portable à l'époque. Euh, donc le fait de pouvoir accéder directement à des boîtes aux lettres, ça sert beaucoup la résistance dans l'organisation de ces réunions, de ces, de ces coups d'action. Aux années 60 du siècle dernier, le Vieux-Lyon était un quartier extrêmement malfamé. Le maire, Louis Pradel, il voulait le détruire parce qu'on considérait que c'était euh, moins cher et plus efficace de raser et après de reconstruire à nouveau. Sa volonté de Louis Pradel, c'était aussi de faire passer l'autoroute par ici, mais les Lyonnais, ils se sont dit non, ça fait partie de notre patrimoine. Euh, L'histoire de la résistance, elle est vraiment inscrite dans les murs de la ville et notamment dans, dans ses travaux. Still to come on The Travel Show, Lucy's here with some gadgets to help you catch up on your sleep when you're on the road. So as far as wake-up lights go, this one is quite expensive, but it will look quite good on your bedside table. Three, two, one, go! And Carmen is in Japan, checking out another Rugby World Cup venue. This week, it's Yokohama. Hey, time on the clock is almost 20 minutes. Time to hot foot it to the next destination. There are plenty of reasons to book a winter break in London, but the weather is certainly not one of them. So this month, we've got three gadgets that aim to get rid of the gloom and brighten up your getaway. First up, it's the Somnio Sleep and Wake Up Light. This is Philips' most recent European model with a simulated sunrise for the mornings and a simulated sunset for switching off in the evenings. The company says it's the only wake up light with a guided wind down feature to relax your breathing and ease the transition into sleep but it doesn't have Bluetooth or any smartphone connectivity. So as far as wake-up lights go, this one is quite expensive, but it does pack in a lot more features than most rivals. Setup is nice and straightforward, plus it will look quite good on your bedside table. Now, it might be too big for your carry-on, but if you're jet-lagged in a foreign country or you're simply struggling to sleep, it could help you feel a lot more revitalised. So you've made it out of your hotel and now all you want to do is warm up with a nice cup of hot coffee. But how do you keep it at the perfect temperature? The Ember Travel Mug lets you select and change the heat of your drink. It's charged with an electric coaster and controlled via an app on your smartphone. So Mike, this month we're taking a look at a bunch of gadgets that are designed to help you through the gloomy winter months, which ties in quite nicely with the rise of wellness tech. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the, the gadgets that you've had hands-on time with. Things like the Apple Watch and Fitbit's kind of smartwatches and trackers. There's some really simple things around breathing. So this idea that when you're kind of stressed and they see a spike in your heart rate, it will say, well look, take a minute out. It's also sleep. A lot of this tech can monitor sleep, but now it's about measuring and giving insights into what this sleep means and so you know there's a lot happening in this space and it's exciting it's definitely yeah, exciting yeah. so what i think is really interesting is that we're seeing wellness features integrated into gadgets that you wouldn't really expect them to be like this travel mug okay. yeah so you can connect it to the apple health app and you can use the data to get a better understanding of how caffeine affects your heart rate and your sleeping in your expert opinion, would you say that these gadgets are actually making us feel better? I mean, that's an interesting point because I think there's a lot of scientific kind of clinical kind of research that still needs to be done on aspects of this. Mm. Well, I think maybe in really subtle and small ways it, it is. It's, it's prompting us to take more time out for ourselves and I think that's a kind of stepping block. So it's been about an hour since I met with Mike and the app is telling me my drink is still at 60 degrees Celsius. So it's doing its job. But the company says it will only maintain that temperature for two hours. And for the price, I think it could last a little bit longer. But if you're a bit more fanatical about maintaining your drink's temperature than I am, it will certainly put an end to those cold coffee tantrums. And what if it all gets a little overwhelming and you need a break from your break? This is the silent mode audio mask, which is essentially a blackout eye mask with noise isolation speakers. So I've come to this ridiculously busy junction to find out just how calming it really is. The mask is lined with memory foam for a snug, comfortable fit, and it connects to an app which beams soothing sounds into your ears and leads you through meditation exercises. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's no guarantee it will transport you to a place of complete tranquility, but it effectively blocks out your surroundings and I do actually feel quite relaxed. Now, it's still early days for this product and it is quite chunky, so I'm not sure I'd want to wear it in bed, but if you need a getaway from your getaway, it really is a nice idea. For the first time ever, the Rugby World Cup heads to Asia this year. 400,000 sports fans will go and see their teams at 10 host cities around Japan in what's also a dry run for the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. Some, though, will be worried about Japan's reputation as a place that's tricky to get around if you don't speak the language. And it's a myth that I think is not always deserved. And to show you why, I'll be exploring six of the host cities against the clock. Yokohama is Japan's second biggest city and lies only 30 minutes outside the capital, Tokyo. It's also where the Rugby World Cup final will take place on November 2nd. So the challenge is this, I've got 90 minutes, the length of time it takes to play a rugby match, plus 10 minutes for half time to see three of its highlights. My friend Ryuzo has been making a plan for me. So compared to cities like Tokyo, where the uh, metro is so complicated, um, Yokohama is pretty easy to navigate because the uh, train lines usually run from north to south. Also, because it's a port town, you can always see the ocean at some direction, so you know where you're going. It's a nighttime challenge, this one. Ryuzo set me up three activities here. Something to see, something to do, and something to eat. So I've got 90 minutes and my time starts in three, two, one, go! Hey! And I start at the city's magnificent Ferris wheel. When it first opened in 1997, the Cosmo Clock 21 was the biggest in the world. Now it's way down the rankings, but it's still a great place to get an overview of the city. This is nice and cosy. Every 15 minutes, there's an impressive light display on the side of the wheel. A full rotation takes the same amount of time. Oh yes, look, this tells you all the sights. English, eagle, ah. Oh look, there's Mount Fuji. I look between these two buildings, but it's dark, so we can't see that. Uh... Japan's first railroad oh. was opened in 1872. So the price of a ticket to come on here is about 800 yen. That's roughly $8 or 5 or 6 pounds. Okay, time on the clock is almost 20 minutes. Time to hot foot it to the next destination. Oh, I see a taxi right there. Okay, so we found the taxi, but the driver's gone to the loo. So let's just wait. Does he know the time is ticking? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Ninja Taxi! This is great! Okay, selfie. So I booked the Ninja Taxi through their website, which is available in English. It adds a thousand yen to the standard bill, which is about ten dollars or seven pounds. <laughs> so it wasn't faster than a regular taxi, but it certainly was way cooler. 42 minutes on the clock. Arigato! High five. So the sign says it's Yokohama's subtropical tea house. This is a twist on animal cafes you can find all over Japan. The subtropical tea house holds over 40 different reptiles you can share tea with. Just don't forget to wash your hands afterwards. I didn't expect them to be roaming free like this or be so big. Check out this guy. Oh my god. Oh. So how many times have you been scratched or bitten? <gasps> oh wow. There's some wounds here. No, I think this is as close as I can get. But it's the perfect place for people who feel uneasy about reptiles to come face to face with their fear, even if they can't bear to touch discarded reptile skin. <laughs> it's not even attached to anything. <laughs> All right, 
right, time's up. We've got to go. Arigato gozaimasu. Your next destination is half an hour from here, so you have to hurry. Try taking the subway from Sakuragi Cho Station. Okay, time check. It's already one hour and four minutes, and I've got seven stops on the train. Hey, this is our stop. Gosh, I have no idea which exit, but. <clears throat> This out. So an adult is 310 yen. If you're a fan of noodle soup, my final destination is a must. Okay, I have five minutes to eat some ramen. Where do I go? The ramen museum includes a recreation of a street from Tokyo in 1958, which was the year instant noodles were invented. Ramen is a quintessential Japanese food with a vast array of broth and toppings to choose from. Normally, I'd think really hard about what kind of ramen I, I would like, but I don't really have the time. Oh, here we go, here we go. Arigato gozaimasu. Okay. Stop. One hour and 31 minutes. We're one minute over, but this definitely looks worth the wait. Well, that's all for this week. Coming up next week, we've got some movie magic for you. It's red carpet and awards week, so Mike's in Hollywood to check out a brand new museum built by the people behind the Oscars that's due to open later this year. It was in 1929 when Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford were just starting the Academy. They said, it's already time for us to start thinking about a film museum. And here we are 90 years later, it's finally here, Los Angeles' first film museum. In the meantime, don't forget you can follow us on social media. All the links should be on your screens right now. But for now, from me, Adia Depitan, and all the Travel Show team here in Morocco, it's... Goodbye.